We're at our final set of videos for E80. In this video set, we're going to talk about autonomous navigation. Now this could actually be its own course, and in fact it is, E160. Maybe soon to be E205 and E206, but we'll see. But this whole field of autonomous navigation has really taken flight in the last 10 to 20 years. We didn't used to need autonomous navigation with our robots. In fact, back in the late 60s, early 70s, You'd start to see these manipulator robots all over the place. You could see them not just in academia, but in industry, and they've really taken over the manufacturing industry. But what was different about these manipulators, that's different from the types of robots we're using in class, is that they are grounded. Most of these manipulators were fixed to the ground and didn't move around quite the same way that our current mobile robots do. Now mobile robots actually started in the late 40s, early 50s. This guy, Gray Walter, was credited as building the first autonomous mobile robots, ones that moved around. It's a really interesting story. He was actually a neuropsychologist, and he wanted to study how animals would sort of reason about the world and move around. And what better way to do that than build replicas? He built this whole series of tortoise robots. You can find them now in museums, and they really were the first autonomous mobile robots. Now they look a lot different than what we're using in class, largely because we're in the underwater world. The first autonomous underwater vehicle, AUV, was built at the University of Washington in the Applied Physics Lab. The SPIRV, the self-propelled underwater research vehicle, was used to go collect data in the ocean. This thing can go down to about a thousand meters. And if you look at this, this is a cutaway view, but you get the impression that this thing looks sort of like a torpedo. And most of the AUVs being built at that time and on were in this torpedo shape, and largely so that they could move faster and farther underwater. These underwater robots had a lot of the same components of today's mobile robots. They've got battery power, they've got a propulsion system, they've got some navigation system, which is sort of what's important to us today. In this particular vehicle, it used an acoustic transponder here to actually communicate with the ship and follow it around. But this gets to the heart of the problem for mobile robots. The biggest problem that, that's been worked on for the last 10, 20, and even 30 years, which is answering the question for the robot, where am I? As we went from manipulator robots to mobile robots, we needed to solve this problem or answer this question, where am I? For robots to really take advantage of their mobility, they need to know where they are in the world. Now answering that question, where am I, is gonna be part of this control loop. You might remember this block diagram representation of a control loop from E79. In this case, the plant or the robot that we're actually gonna control is one of these underwater robots that we've been building for the past couple semesters. Now to make this robot autonomously navigate, we have to determine the control signal or control effort to send to these thrusters. How fast should each thruster spin so that we can get to where we want to go? Let's be a bit more formal about where we want to go. We're gonna call our desired state, which might be a position x, y, z, for example, x des. This is a vector. Now the actual state is just x. So we've got the actual state of the robot and our desired state. We also have what's called our estimated state, where we put a little hat on it. Now typically, to determine how fast we should spin our thrusters, we look at the difference between our desired state of the robot, maybe it's the desired position and orientation, and the estimated position and orientation of the robot. The difference between these two vectors is our error vector, which will be fed into our controller, which will determine the control effort or how fast we should spin these motors. Now if everything's working perfectly, the actual x, the actual state, will match the desired state. So we've actually sort of ignored this bottom branch, which we know is our feedback loop, which has sensors to take measurements of the robot as it moves around in the world. And these sensors produce a vector of measurements we call z, which are fed into a state estimator. This is some sort of algorithm that fuses all the measurements to produce some sort of optimal state estimate. And we just keep going around this loop. 
We have a desired state. We have an estimated state. The difference is fed into a controller, which sends to the robot, and so on and so forth. And these control loops can run anywhere from hundreds of hertz to maybe on the order of even one hertz. We're going to use the next few videos to look at all these different components. How we might architect state estimator, the sensors that would be feeding into such a state estimator, and then if we actually have state estimates, what type of controller we might use to make this robot move around. So what are our questions that we need to answer over the next few videos? How do we estimate states? What sensors do I use to estimate states? And how do we control the robot? We've got three more videos. Hopefully you'll be excited to watch them. Thanks.